I am Alex Vance, Chair of Core Inc., doing business as Chorus. Um, before we start, I want to welcome you and express the board's thanks for your joining us today. Uh, we'll be telling you more about Chorus's performance the past year and about plans for the year ahead. But the first order of business today is the election of directors. Um, for reference, the board may consist of between 12 and 18 directors. Today, there are five seats to be elected and the number of directors is currently set at 18, including the executive director, director who serves as um, ex officio in a non-voting basis. The majority of the directors must be affiliated with a member organization and represent nonprofit organizations. Additionally, the bylaws provide for the appointment of up to two members at large whose expertise the board determines will be beneficial. Directors serve for three-year terms and the slate will reach the end of their terms at the annual meeting and this slate at the end of the annual meeting in 2024. Um, it is also acknowledged that the Core Inc. Secretary, Robert Harrington, um, informed us that he could not attend today due to illness. Therefore, um, consistent with our bylaws, I, in my capacity as chair, will appoint Howard as the secretary for the 2021 annual members meeting and direct him to perform all the duties of the secretary for this meeting. So secretary, take it away. Yeah. So chairwoman, I present the following. The notice of meeting dated March 8th, 2021 and April 5th, 2021, stating the meeting's time, place and purpose and the affidavit stating that a copy of the notice of this annual meeting of the members to be sent to each of the voting members of record on March 8th, 2021 and April 5th, 2021, all of which will be incorporated into the minute book of the corporation as part of the minutes of this meeting. <clears throat> a complete list, which was certified by Robert Harrington, the secretary of the voting members of CHORUS as of the close of business on March 24th, 2021, the record date fixed in accordance with the bylaws of the corporation. And this list is gonna be kept open for the inspection during this meeting and shows that as of the close of business on March 24th, 2021, there were 43 voting members of CHORUS. Okay, thank you, Howard. Um, to facilitate the election, uh, we have the secretary has appointed Tara Packer as the inspector of elections. The inspectors have taken a poll of the members uh, represented at the meeting and confirmed that there are present at the meeting online or by proxy. Yeah. 20, yeah, 21, sorry. 21 voting representatives of the voting members of chorus who were voting members of record at the close of business March 24, 2021. One third of the voting members, 15, is the quorum required to do business. A quorum of the chorus voting members being present in person or by proxy, this meeting is declared lawfully and properly convened. The secretary will now present the nominations for the board. I nominate the following to serve as members of the board of directors of chorus, each for a three year term ending at the annual meeting in 2024. Michael Levine Clark, the University of Denver, Diane Sullenberger of PNAS, and for second term of three years, John or Jack Oakes, the American Chemical Society, John Glover Wiley, and Dawn Melly IEEE. Okay, thank you. Does someone second these nominations? I second. second. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, Matthew. I don't. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, no independent nominations having been received. The nominations are hereby declared closed. Tara, confirming. Yes, sorry, there um, 21 votes. 49% of the membership has voted. Great. Um, if there's any member present who has not voted previously by proxy or who wishes to change their proxy vote, please use the Google form listed on the agenda and cast your vote. The inspectors, Tara, will collect the votes in five minutes, at which time the voting will be closed and the inspectors will make a final tabulation of votes at that time. While the votes are being tabulated, do we need to pause or are we good? Um, Howard, at the request of Jack Oaks, our treasurer, will give a brief report on the financial status of Chorus as of the end of the 2020 fiscal year. Uh, 
Sorry if I have a little paper shuffling going on here. So um, this is Jack's treasurer's report, uh, according to him and also according to the officers. It's very important for you to take the long view um, when we look at uh, financials. Uh, it's important to know that CORUS continues to have a critical mass of large and mid-sized members. We are, we're finding that attracting the long tail of smaller members continues to be a challenge. Uh, the, we definitely did have some impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on our on our revenue side. Um, but it is important to realize that we've diversified our revenue um, between 2018 and through 2021. Um, and that the diversification happened in the form of institution dashboard service, our Japan dashboard service. And in 2020, for the first time ever, we were actually named in a, in a NSF grant. Uh, we also in 2020 started getting some money in regarding sponsorships, regarding our forums, and we're aiming to do more in 2021 as possible. Some very Big important news is that we carried forward $182,000 into 2021 and did not spend any of the 2021 renewals that we received in 2020. So that puts us in a much better position for the future. So if you look at this particular chart, which is our 2020 financial overview broken down by months, you can see that this is the calendar. And despite the pandemic, we had a pretty good year for collecting renewals and we kept our expenses well under control. The end of year revenue was 828,000. Our expenses were 673,000 and our cash was 732,000. So this slide gives a view of Chorus's financial history since the actual beginning. Uh, and as you can see here, this year, our revenue just edged out our expenses. So the green line is our cash history, which was improved, including the early loans of 2013 and 2014. The blue line is our revenue, which is primarily from membership dues and other area of revenue, as I mentioned before, is institution funder dashboard subscriptions, plus the small bump from sponsorships of our new forums. A smaller portion of the revenue, but course is working on is, is, is definitely to increase this line in the future. The red line represents our expenses, this is most noteworthy as we've highlighted the challenges course has faced back in 2015. Um, so that's where we were, we were building into different areas that we weren't sure would, would be uh, work for Chorus. But now we pretty much know where Chorus is headed. Uh, our, and so for the last few years, we've been pretty steady state. Our expenses were, have been reduced in 2016 and we've continued to keep them relatively flat. And, a more uh, and so then let's move on. So here you can see the 2020 revenue uh, was lower than budget due to shortfalls from the pandemic. It includes all the 2020 rev renewals received as of the 31st of December of, 20, of 2020. The new 2020 publisher and affiliate membership fees of uh, plus paid services are all shown here. Course was not able to recruit any new members, unfortunately, in 2020. Uh, we slowed selling in 2020 due to the expected income shortfalls from our stakeholders, but more focus is already in place for new, adding new members um, in 2021. And I'm, I'm actually happy to say that we, that's already starting to pay off. Paid services includes the renewal of JST for the Japan Dashboard Service, the University of Florida, the University of Denver, Tohoku Gaikuin University, the National Institute for Material Science, Keio University, National Institute for Environmental Studies, Recant and Chiba, all renewing for the institution dashboard service. And that's really good news. This revenue continues to grow and we've already had signed contracts for Los Alamos and Iowa State University for this year. The 2020 actual expenses were 673 against the budget of 816. Our, our budget was tight through the year with high, as you could expect, highly controlled spending on of course travel, uh, IT development, legal expenses, project management and marketing consulting and expenses. The 2021 budget, this is the first time you're going to actually see it here as, as approved by the board last year, uh, and this is the, on the expense side, the majority of core expenses are for human resources in the staff and consultants in the consultant area, and our consulting is broken down between ongoing consultant work for Asia, the Asia Pacific area, the consultants working on strategic development, marketing and communications, as well as there's a small fee here for Kinekinia in Japan, who last year started working for us uh, helping us in the APAC region, specifically in Japan, for subscriptions in, in that region. 
Are there any questions about our financial report? Okay. Hearing none, seeing none in the chat, we will return to the election. Are there any member organizations present that would like to vote and have not done so? If not, the polls for the election of directors are now closed and the inspectors, Tara, will report the final results. Yes, we have 22 total votes, which is 51% of the membership. Okay. The report of the inspectors then shows that a majority of the voting members present in person or by proxy have voted for the election of the directors of the following persons for three-year terms. Michael Levine Clark, University of Denver, Jack Oaks, American Chemical Society, John Glover, Wiley, Don Melly, IEEE, Diane Sullenberger, PNAS. They are hereby declared elected to serve as directors of CHORUS. Um, with our great thanks, we're delighted. Uh, now, Howard will provide an update on CHORUS's activity. All right, I feel like it's the Howard Show today. <laughs> so, uh, good morning and good afternoon, wherever you might be. So, our community uh, continues to grow. Um, as we all know, it's there to reduce the burden of complying with open and public access mandates. We are, comp we are comprised of an ever-growing number of institutions, learned societies, society publishers, as well as commercial publishers. We do make up more than 75% of the world's published output from funded research. And our partner agencies listed here, NSF, DOE, DOD, USDA, JST, and others are invaluable allies in helping us in our mission. So here is the current board prior to the election today. Uh, this board must always be comprised of a majority of non-for-profits. It's built into our bylaws. And I look forward to welcoming the new board members today. We also have a few working groups and committees made up of volunteers. The Academic Advisory Working Group, led by Judy Russell, is one of our newest ones. It was created in late 2019 and advises the board about uh, potential core services and directions for institutions. Um, and so, so Judy, thank you very much for all of your work. The CHORUS Technical Group, led by Mark Doyle and Evan Owens, advises new members on their CHORUS implementations and guides staff on new technology ideas. And also we have welcomed um, new members uh, from various different agencies. Um, and I also have, want to make a point here that Evan Owens is retiring uh, from the industry. So we want to thank him for all the work that he's done on the technical working group. We have our communications working group led by Sarah Gerard. This helps our marketing efforts and outreach to our stakeholders. Um, so Sarah from AIPP leads this group and a lot of thanks to them for all the work that they've done on Twitter, email marketing, surveys, our website, and also an upcoming annual report, which should be released next week. Here's our small staff. So many thanks go to Tara Packer and Mark Robertson for doing the heavy lifting that makes Chorus work. Our development services are supplied by a company called Ace Labs. Our legal continues to be uh, Ewenstein and Roth. And our newest uh, member of our group there is our accounting is now done by a group called Numbers for Nonprofits. So what I always like to do in each year is to take us through our goals and see how well we did. So the goals for 2020 were approved by the board in December of 2019. And I think we all agree that the world has changed dramatically since then. But anyway, let's see how we did against these, these goals. So looking into the upper left quadrant here, it talks about the funder participation. So the green represents meeting the goal. Orange means that we made some progress and red means that we failed to meet the goal. So here you can see that uh, we did maintain and extend our 11 agency partners. We had an excellent relationship with all of our agency participants. And in fact, those agency participants participated in our, our, our chorus events, two which were global and, and two which were in Japan. And I'm happy to say we have an enormous amount of funders that are going to be on today's program later in today's date. Uh, we were not successful in getting another US agencies. However, our conversations with NASA continue to go. And we did not manage to get any new international partners despite uh, trying to do a lot of work in Japan. So moving on to member participation. So here you can, say, you can see that we did not achieve our goal of 51 publishers. We maintained 42 publishers. We were very close in affiliates. 
uh, we were trying to get more, seven or more, and so we ended up with six. We did meet the goal of 85% of our of our funder, uh, sorry, of our members being fully implemented, um, and you can see the breakdown there. And our publisher members also participated in courses events, the two one in global and, and one in Japan. And we also did manage to complete our membership survey, which we had as a goal for this year. Moving on to the institutions quadrant, you can see here that we did not uh, quite get to our U.S. institution numbers. Uh, we wanted to try to get to 22. We ended the year with four U.S. institutions. Um, and then that, that was in a large part to the fact that the institutions drew pretty tight during the pandemic. And we were advised by our academic working group that actually this would not be the year to really try to pursue new memberships because really we would not get the attention. Uh, similarly, in, um, in Japan, there was contraction going on. So there uh, we did not achieve 18 and we only got seven, but we, we continue to uh, grow there now. They seem to be opening up a little bit more now. And we do have one ongoing Japan trial. There was a lot of work that we did over the last year regarding exploring new services. So we worked very hard on a, a beta of a data set report that we've been sharing with some, some of our institution colleagues, as well as a new affiliation report. And also the institutions also uh, did participate in a number of other course forums and workshops. So finally, the final quadrant is the uh, expand metadata data database. And here you see a lot of green because we're doing a lot of work back in 2020. So um, in 2020, uh, we finally uh, started monitoring all articles from all publishers and all funders with funder IDs. We expanded the coverage of our data, uh, data set metadata with our new data set report, which is, which is still in testing. We started adding raw information to our institution dashboards. We created a data availability policy index um, by pulling together all of the various different data availability policies that we found on publishers' websites. We created an MOU with Datasite, which I'll talk more about in a few minutes. We have a collaborations with Coleridge Initiative. And also we were, as I mentioned, we have we were named a recipient in the NSF grant to AGU on data citations of public funded research, which I'll also cover. As part of the membership, uh, we also produced a metadata gap for publishers and we improved our VOR open access monitoring via the GetFTR system coming from STM. Um, the one thing that we did not achieve, we did not achieve uh, doing gold VOR deposits because actually that was deprioritized by the board. One of the big things to mention is, is really, I mean, this was a big effort on our part and a big change for our dat databases certainly is that our, because we are now monitoring all articles of funded research from all publishers and funders worldwide, the number as you can see here jumped up considerably from you know a little over uh, 600,000 um, up to over 4 million articles that we're actually monitoring. So here's a look at our enhanced data set reporting. So in our current dashboards, we, we currently just have links to data sets, but we knew that that wasn't going to be enough. So uh, we, have, we have now have this new report that we are uh, testing out and refining. And in here, people can answer the questions of like who created the data? What kind of data is it? Is it a collection, a data set or software? What's the title of the data? which repository is storing the data or, or software, and who is the funder, and what are the associated award numbers and usage rights. So there's a lot of information here that we can pull out of Datasite, and our partnership with Datasite continues to grow. So I wanted to give you a little bit of insider insight into what this grant was about. So the grant has a very long name. The grant is Accelerating Open and Fair Data Practices Across the Earth, Space, and Environmental Sciences, breath a pilot with the NSF to support public access to research data. So this is a two year project that AGU uh, was given a grant from NSF for, and it's all about implementing fair data practices across uh, the ESIP uh, space. In particular, what this is about is studying and improving the data citations for research funded by NSF that are, uh, and, and that are published by AGU and then the point is, is to have them show up and be captured in the NSF public access repository. You can see there's a lot of different things that are here, but in particular what Chorus is responsible for is, is to present new customized data set reports about the linked articles, the names and types of data set, the repository and creator names, subject classification and reuse license information. So you can see that this ties very nicely into the work that we had already started. Uh, the, there are various different participants in this in this work. So it's it's AGU and it's us and NSF, of course, but also Dryad, 
the Earth Science Information Partners are part of it. And of course, Wiley, who is the publishing uh, partner of AGU, is also involved. So coming from a completely different angle about data, we partnered with the Coleridge Rich Text Project on their Rich Context Project. This aims to apply machine learning and natural language processing techniques, the searches publications provided by participating chorus members to do what? Well, to find what data sets are in the publication, to show how they've been used, to find other experts who have used the data, to identify other related data sets, but most importantly, to show impact of the, of the funded data sets back to the US agencies, institutions and publishers in an ongoing service. So right now, the Coleridge Initiative is conducting what's called a casual contest, where they bring in um, a teams of people competing for a purse of money. And this is the, the contest is called Show Us, meaning capital U.S., the data. And that started just last month. I'm actually very proud to say that there are over 500 teams that are competing to develop the best algorithms and workflows for these problems. So I mentioned before that we've done some gap analysis work back in 2020 to help our publisher members improve the metadata that, that they submitted to Crossref. And in particular, we were studying the ORCID IDs, the reuse license metadata, and also publication dates. But in 2021, part of our, part of our work with Datasite is we have a gap analysis that we're working up also to study ORCID IDs, but importantly, to study you know, the gaps in the creators of this, these data sets and software importantly, the institutions that these people were coming from and who are the funders, because we think that these are the, some of the key elements that need to be studied and need to be improved um, so that future reporting can be improved. So I mentioned before that we uh, launched the Chorus Publisher Data Availability Policies Index on our website. So here's the view of that. Uh, this is a free centralized index of our member publishers data availability policies with links to those policies, <clears throat> excuse me, on the publisher's site. So over the last few years, as you all know, the publishers have been making their data availability policies known either at the publisher level or at the journal level. And these policies range in their mandate, but most require authors to make all data necessary to replicate their studies findings publicly available without restriction at the time of publication. And we felt here at Chorus that making these policies much more transparent will help everyone raise their game in open science. So this chart is available now on our website and it's gonna be updated at least annually by Chorus staff. One of the things that is not yet public, but I felt today was a good day to announce it, is that we have, because of our work on the data availability policies index, uh, we've been asked by some leads of a force 11 working group on software citations to do something very similar for indexing publisher software citation policies. So this is still a draft page, we're still building it, but we expect it to go live in the next month or so. Um, so keep, keep, out, keep a lookout for an announcement about it. And then finally, I want to mention uh, that we are convening our stakeholders uh, throughout the year, and we've been finding common problems to enabling open research and helping define potential solutions, even if they're not particularly developed by, by Chorus. So we've held four events in 2020 and 2021 and have another one at the, uh, literally uh, in a few hours uh, called the Chorus Forum, Making the Future of Open Research Work. This has been a really big success for us. And also I wanna say many thanks to STM and JST who have partnered with two of our other workshops. And the last thing I'll mention here is, um, we've already kind of talked about this um, with our treasurer's report, but we needed to meet or exceed our financial projections. So you can see that we pretty much had a really good year. And so the, despite our, our lower income, expected income, we actually managed to roll 182, thousand uh, dollars in, into 21, which is a real achievement for us. So enough about 2020, now on to 2021. This is the time of year where um, I get the opportunity to announce what our new goals are. And you can see that our new goals are coming in a brand new format that, um, that we haven't had before. And so the board and I worked on this um, and we felt that the core of what CORE should really be about is to make open research work. And to do that, we want to help scale OA compliance amongst our membership. We want to develop data metrics. We, we want to actually formally announce that we're here to help improve metadata quality amongst our membership. And we're also here to connect stakeholders. So you can see in each one of these areas, that I still believe in fours. So we have, we're in, in scaling, we're going to help monitor and report on all the published content um, and potentially review, reviewing uh, the use, 
whether or not we can provide some use in preprints. We're engaging in a society engagement program to try to figure out how best we can help societies big and small. We are once again looking at that, uh, whether or not we want to dep deposit versions of record into various different repositories as needed. And we also want to target new funder partnerships, especially in the world of data. So speaking of data, the, regarding uh, the data metrics, you've already heard things, some things that we're doing. We're going to continue to partner to develop federal data set and software value metrics. We're going to partner to, to provide data set software citation reporting, and those are already underway. Improving metadata quality, we're going to analyze metadata coverage for publishers and funders, monitor data availability policies, add institution IDs to all our course tools, so not just the institution dashboard, monitor OA for transform, transformational agreements, and also do a few white papers and speaker engagements, which we've been doing already in a few short months. Regarding connecting stakeholders, we've, we will and continue to do our chorus forums, creating some chorus workshops, uh, and also host some member and partner working group meetings. And finally, partner with others to help en enhance our outreach. So I thank you very much. Without all of you and your support, I couldn't have done it. So thanks so much. Okay. Um, any questions for Howard? I agree that Howard, um, you know, congratulations on your accomplishments in the forum space and a lot of really interesting data and metadata oriented projects. Anything anyone else would like to add or ask? Okay. In that case, the second biggest event of the day is to talk about Susan King. Um, so I'd like to recognize that today is Susan's last annual meeting as a board member, which breaks my small and crusty heart. Susan was a founding member of Chorus and served as a chair from 2013 to 2018 and continued on the board until today. Her influence and drive for excellence will be greatly missed on the board as well as her sense of humor and attention to fashion and company at the bar. Um, we look forward, however, to having Susan continue on chorus working groups and we will not let her get away so quickly. Although I totally hear her interest in, in bringing fresh eyes and voices onto the board. So we're equally thank you, thankful for our new members. Um, thank you, Susan. Uh, Alex, I'm very, very flattered, and I would have changed my comfy sweater um, to a more appropriate jacket, should I have known. Um, it's been an absolute honor and pleasure to serve. It's been fantastic to, to watch you as chair. Uh, the board is in great shape, and I look forward to being able to contribute in whatever way I can. Thank you very much. Thank you, Susan. Um, I'll also recognize that Scott Delman has stepped down from the board in March 2021, uh, principally because he's become the new chair of the Crossref board. Scott served on the chorus board from 2015 to 2021 and was treasurer from 2016 to 21. And so we also want to recognize and appreciate Scott's support over the years and his diligence um, monitoring and our finances and our financial reporting. We wish him great luck and we appreciate uh, RUP and ACM's continued support, of course, so those relationships continue. Um, we're here from Howard. So um, with that said, is there any other business to come before the close of the meeting? Hearing none, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Any second? Second. Okay, thank you. Um, hearing no objection, the 2021 annual meeting of members of CHORUS is hereby adjourned. Thank you, everyone. It's wonderful to see your faces and we're so appreciative. And Matthew, good to be with you today. Thank you. <laughs>